Just five miles from the mainland of Michigan, there is a different existence on Bablo Island. The arrival of the 95-foot Kristen D is a community event and almost the only way to supply the livelihoods of its inhabitants. Just three miles away, the bustling Mackinac Island welcomes almost one million visitors a year. Bablo gets fewer than 5,000, even though it's over 13 times larger than Mackinac. Since Europeans first arrived, the Bablo has always been in the shadow of Mackinac. Its early purpose was to supply timber and quicklime for the fort on Mackinac Island. But island residents are just fine with keeping things on the proverbial down low. The French actually named the island and pronounced it Beaublon, meaning white wood, but islanders don't care. They just ignore the spelling and casually say it their way, Bob Lowe. And that's kind of how it is on Bob Lowe Island. They don't care what the world thinks. Everybody waves here, and they are eager to make friends. They're counting the population this year. It's a census year, but it's been right around 50 for years. There aren't any paved roads, and you'd be wise to bring supplies, because the only store on the island keeps island time. But there's a post office, there's a school, and there's even an airport with a big runway, a fancy terminal, and lots of hangar space. I'm here with Poppins. Poppins, what are we doing? Oh, we are in Sheboygan and we are on the ferry ready to go over to Pablo Island, also actually named uh, Boy Blanc Island. Or Boys Blanc if you're from Michigan. <laughs> Thanks, sir. We'll see you later. Thanks. Hey, don't work too hard today. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Bablo Island, Bois Blanc Island, or Boublon, depending on your pronunciation of French. French named things, the English slaughtered the names, and then the, finally the English gave up and just called it something completely different than its spelling or pronunciation. So we're uh, heading to uh, what is rumored to be a hideout of John Dillinger back in the day. So uh, we'll let you know when we get there. Where are we going, Poppins? We are going to John Dillinger's cabin where he hid out after uh, plastic surgery. I don't Yes, after plastic surgery. Why did he have plastic surgery? What What did he have to do? He had his, he had his well, face he was altered? part of the mafia, and so he wanted to be in disguise. Guy escaped from prison like three times or something. And um, he did get shot shortly after his surgery, though. He went back to Chicago and got shot. Got betrayed by a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have the Census Bureau, where they put a Census Bureau bag. And, uh, yeah. So this is one of the three cabins that were allegedly his hideout. Uh, you know, I can't stand these people, these dang, these dang rich people and the things that they do. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going I'm to rob banks. So I'm not terribly familiar with John Dillinger, but I do know that he turned to a life of crime. He was kind of a petty criminal in his teen years. He was arrested for a crime and uh, had a 10-year sentence to it. When he went to uh, when he went to prison, he vowed to come out the worst criminal ever, and it turned out he kind of did. But anyway, so he had plastic surgery, and he came here to hide out while he healed. Apparently, he was bandaged, and uh, a lot of the island residents will tell you that that's the uh, that's the truth. Well, we don't know. We don't have definitive proof that John Dillinger was here, but um, the islanders apparently wouldn't turn him in at the time, 
because it was the 1930s prohibition was all the rage and uh i guess they were making a lot of alcohol and whiskey on the island here so they weren't going to turn the criminal in and bring the feds out here crawling around scrutinizing everything so that they would get caught so. personally i think it's a lot of debris just in the woods so there's that so dillinger's hideout was the first thing that grabbed my attention to bob Lowe. But it was time to find out what's behind the curtain on the island, so we decided to have lunch and take a couple days to explore. Lunch with a view. Right, Poppins? Oh, this is the best. Best grilled cheese ever. It's a grilled ham and cheese, but... So, yeah, we're kind of on the end of the island by Mackinac. And we're just kind of cruising around. And uh, there's really nothing around here for a while. Saw this sign, AED, emergency only, fire, first aid. It's not locked. So what's going on? Sure enough, there is an AED here. Medical supplies. And West End Fire stuff is here. So. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So they keep supplies out here so that when they need to, they can put out fires, I guess. And they probably got some packs in there, ladder. All the information you need. That's pretty cool. A little shed out in the middle of nowhere with emergency supplies. Cause it's probably like a 20 minute drive to the end of the island. So we're heading to the north end of Bablo Island. Uh, there is an old sawmill that has been gone for quite a while. The only thing that's left is a boiler all rusted and tipped over. So we're gonna go see if we can find it and check it out. And Bablo actually was has, has been, until the 1950s, was the woodlot, or its purpose was to provide wood for the fort at Mackinac for repairs. And, they felt that uh, because you couldn't cut trees in Mackinac, there simply isn't enough to maintain a fort like that. So they'd also gather their maple syrup from here and they would bury those that died of a contagious disease on this island. So it was kind of like the back lot, the supplier to Fort Mackinac and Mackinac Island. Rumor has it, Poppins, that somewhere around here is an old sawmill boiler. Now we're, we're going to pay a heavy price for exploring for this thing. Again, we're on Bob Lowe Island. If you haven't been here, you're crazy missing out. Nobody comes here except the hardy, the broken, the teenagers, the kids, and they don't want to leave when they come here. As one couple told us, told us you have to make up your own fun. And uh, the world just isn't used to that today. But, but there's this, just a quiet place with all this. And Poppins hasn't stopped exploring and looking for shit. So anyways, I said we're going to pay a heavy price looking for this sawmill boiler. And it's rumored to be around here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Hey, I found it. The system that used steam sawmills was kind of crazy. I got to see one in the 80s back when I worked for a lumber company. Steam everywhere. Did I say 90s? I meant 80s. Steam everywhere in this big saw going, wasting a lot of wood. And uh, it basically was a, uh, it was a bit of a nightmare. But this boiler provided steam power and steam would come rolling out of the sawmill. And uh, that steam power would turn a saw blade, allowing, uh, allowing for uh, some cutting of the wood. Now the question remains on this particular boiler for some of those that believe they're in the know is if this was a locomotive, and a lot of people don't think it was a locomotive. Was it custom built for a sawmill? I don't know. And there's the other theory that this sawmill, or this boiler, used to be on a steamship. And it was offloaded here. I don't know. If anyone knows, please lend some of your knowledge on what's going on here. Here comes Poppins. She's going to tell me to get off. Nah, she never does that. 
Well, we have some archaeological evidence. W.C. Duman, July 24th, 63, I think is what that means. So we'll have to look it up and see what was the deal. Oh, there's a geocache in here. Look what we found, ladies and gentlemen. It's either a geocache or a bomb. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not going to exchange anything. We've got drugs, ink pens, a credit card. What is this? <laughs> there's a there's a days in rise and shine. Team Kelson. Nice job, Team Kelson. Let me just pause here to let everyone know that um, geocaching and kids, it's a great way to get kids uh, interested in uh, outdoor things and things you can do when you go camp. Oh, look. Ah, safe. Hollow point. Okay, we're gonna take that out of the we're gonna take that out of the chi the kids geocache, um, maybe not. Um, but we got some money here, so the kids come out here. They can exchange prizes. Um, they can get a pencil sharpener at fifty cents, and then you can sign the logbook. I think I'm gonna leave a treasure. We'll leave a five dollar bill. So, those of you on YouTube and Facebook fans and fans of Restless Viking, there's your challenge. There's a boiler somewhere on an island in Lake Huron, Bob Lowe Island, that has a geocache hidden in it. There's $5 in it for you, $5. And it only costs you $19 a person, and like $6 to $8 a car to come across in the ferry. So it's like going to the casino with free money. The secret ingredient to any wilderness hamburger is Tabasco sauce. Just a, just a tiny bit. Use your little finger like this and nothing comes out. Oh, there we go. I guess you use it like this. There you go. <laughs> so we got some uh, hash browns with peppers and onions. Ouch. A little hot, I'll have to get a glow out. I don't know how well these are gonna do in a pot, but we'll see. Second important secret ingredient is Old Forester whiskey. And the reason that you use Old Forester is because it makes me want to cut. Nah, I'm just kidding. Just a little bit. A little bit of that. Whiskey taste. Hey Poppins, we're out of buns. Bread will work. Good morning, y'all. It's Saturday morning, and uh, Poppins is over here doing important research. And we got three things to accomplish today. First is to find a lighthouse, which is uh, pretty remote, and we're told by the locals that you can't drive there. <laughs> That's the thing about locals, they, they tell you things, but you know, kind of take it with a grain of salt because uh, they don't drive like we do, they don't travel like we do, so, um, and they don't have the vehicle that we do. So whatever they think you can't do, most likely is going to be a really nice trail. We're here at the uh, Bablo Ferry Dock. Ferry's not here. It's probably on its way. It leaves at eight o'clock, so it should be underway. The second thing we're gonna do today is look for a marker laid by Lucius Lyon on the northernmost peninsula of Bablo Island. Where does the road go? Oh, there it goes. Oh, around the tree. And then around the other tree. Maybe. <laughs> A little slow going here. This is the road that never ends. It goes on and on, my friends. Some people started driving, not knowing where it went. And then they kept on driving forever till they're dead. We do not own the rights to that song. The rights to that song the words at least, belong to Chapstick. Thanks Chapstick for the entertainments. So uh, we're here with uh, Vincent. He is an explorer of the island. And how old are you, Vincent? I'm 18. He's 18 and uh, he's been exploring this place since he, you were eight, 10, somewhere in there? Oh, at least 12 years. So we met him on the trail. Um, he passed a nice kid. He kind of let us know that we could pass the road pretty much and the road was in good shape. And uh, he's been kind of uh, back here after, what was it, eight years? Uh, almost five, six at least years. Okay. 
So you're back out here exploring stuff. Your family used to come up here a lot, and and, yeah. and, and now you're back. And he's he's got his he's got his rig here and he is tearing it up, man. He's he's already visited like seven places already or something this morning, and we're still working on our first one. Well, we made it to the uh, the Bablo Lighthouse, Vincent. It's very nice to meet you. Uh, let's do a fist bump or whatever because of COVID. <laughs> but you know, it's nice to find somebody during the zombie apocalypse to keep. Like, do you find that people on this island are more friendly than than yeah, down south? Yeah. Friendly. Yeah, I usually find that. The folks here are always more friendly yeah. than and more open, especially. <laughs> well, most people around where I live. Yeah. A anywhere else in the United States, yeah. Yeah, yeah so somebody's been taking really good care of it. It looks like the bricks have been power washed. So if you make it out here, make sure you're respectful. These, uh, these people own it. And if it wasn't for the Jan family, this wouldn't look this nice. Um, it's in really good shape. It, it was in disrepair when they bought it back in 1964. It is their vacation home. So just imagine if you're vacationing at your vacation home and a bunch of people in funny looking bug nets come up. They should be really friendly and fun to talk to. Is this the oil house? Yep. So this lighthouse, the original lighthouse was built 1828. And the original Boblanc uh, or Bablo lighthouse was the second lighthouse on Lake Huron after Fort Gratiot. Great view. See the spiral staircase. 52 foot tower. Back from the beach. Well, there's an old shed back there. So the first lighthouse was built for $5,000 of government money. That was back when stuff was cheap. It's a 65 foot tower, so taller than this one, but it was down by the beach. And during the years of 1936 to 37, the water rose quite high to the point where the lighthouse was in danger of collapse. In December 1937, Emily, who was the daughter of the original lighthouse keeper Ward, was at the lighthouse with an orphan boy of uh, Ward's family friend. They were hanging out and uh, it was a pretty bad storm and Ward was at Mackinac, so he couldn't get back. And Emily actually writes in a book about her experience where she looked out the window of the keeper's quarters and saw a crack in the lighthouse. And she had the foresight to go up and get the Lewis lens materials to save them and then she saw a big crack forming a lighthouse and they ran out the back of the keeper's quarters and then the lighthouse collapsed and the waves washed over it it's quite a dramatic story for this little lighthouse in the middle of nowhere that's impossible for most people except us explorers to get to right vincent yeah yes exactly yeah. wow well maintained nice fresh coats of paint looks like they used to have a cage on the front or something you got to appreciate people who just take it upon themselves to restore something of historical value like this, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go check out the old shed. We always got to explore old sheds. You never know if there's going to be a body in them or something. Uh, I don't know if they're here. <laughs> Seeing it's someone's vacation home. Yeah, that's true. They're probably not throwing bodies in there. No. <laughs> have you been in it yet? No, I have not. Well, let's go check it out. So that's probably how they get in when they come here. Look at that steel roof. That's cool. Oh yeah, it's falling out. It's falling out yeah. So would you stay here overnight? I wouldn't trust that fort too much. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I wouldn't actually trust standing in here. We'd probably get caught. Because that roof, uh, kind of on its... Look, <laughs> doesn't look too stable. Wow, this door is old, you can tell. <laughs> door oh, man, look at that. What's that strap for? Is that someone's belt? Is that like an old belt? Kind of looks like it. I don't know what that is. I can't tell. Huh. I'm not very adept with historical belts. <laughs> I know history well. But... I myself don't know much about historical belts. So I find that roofing material. It's fascinating, isn't it? It's <laughs> coming out of me little pieces of metal for the roof, huh? Oh, well, have a whole expedition team going now. <laughs> so this trail, I believe, goes to the boathouse. The shore that we were, that is in front of the lighthouse gets a little rough as evidenced by the eight foot piles of rock by the shore. And so I think they landed on the other side 
It's a little more protected from the grand expanse, the total expanse of Lake Huron. So after the first lighthouse collapsed in 1938, they said, let's give it another shot. And they got another $5,000 from the feds, from Congress. And they built a 35 foot tower, but this time not next to the shore. But that lighthouse had trouble with the glass and lenses fogging up. It was a Lewis, Lewis lantern or Lewis light, which uh, is an older light that doesn't shine very far. And this Frenchman Frenzel invented a lens that can uh, concentrate the light and send it out to sea. And you could see it for like 13 and a half miles or so. So in 1852, they upgraded the Lewis lens to the Frenzel lens. Then in 1867, they uh, got 14 grand. So let's give her another shot. Cause I guess the uh, second lighthouse was always in disrepair and having trouble. So in 67 and $14,000, they built the present day lighthouse that exists today and a hundred years later almost to the day the Jan family bought it in disrepair and have fixed it up kudos if the Jan family ever sees this you guys are awesome so straight to the opposite shore of the peninsula we've got a shack looks like it might be made completely of concrete with an open door and me with no camera or no flashlight that's oh, the boathouse what did you think so about? they drag them in there i thought it was a garage for model t's and for camaros oh well, of course you did <laughs> hey that's not that's a cool. bad idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's got the the rails used to come in right here it's cool how it's dug out so my gosh that's a concrete construction interesting I see that every day so they used to pull the boats up on rails to this door uh it doesn't look like they do that anymore I guess this was probably shore and then the rails would be out there and then they they were like little railroad tracks and they'd set the boat on there and grease the rails and pull it up into the boathouse. When they launch it, they just let it ride down the rails back into the water. And there's more of Boblo Island. At some point, what is that? What is that tall thing? Is that the bridge right there? That might be. Pillar to the bridge. You guys can't see it on video because, you know. Uh, oh yeah, that is definitely one of the pillars for the bridge. You got some pretty strong metal sea beams and then there's concrete on the roof and of course or no it's not oh yeah there is reinforced concrete and then they put metal recently they put metal on top to protect it so that's very cool now we are just south of the lighthouse in the northern tip and uh, vincent's uh, gonna join me for our adventure a quarter of a mile into that crap we're gonna look for a granite marker i know driving in the middle of nowhere you uh, sacrifice equipment and health and well-being to go find a piece of granite. But it's a pretty cool story. Um, and it was placed in 1827. We're going to see if we can find it. So, you ready? Yeah, I am. He's always ready. All right, let's go. So, in 1800, a man named Lucius Lyons was born. And some of you may be familiar with that name. Because of Lyon Street in Grand Rapids, Lyon Square. Maybe Lyons, Michigan. South Lyon, Michigan. Lucius Lyon was a prominent figure in Michigan history, and I'm sure some of you know that. This looks like a path, doesn't it, right here? He was a school teacher. But in his summers and at the academy that he taught at, he would also study surveying and engineering. He became a surveyor, and in the summers he'd come to Michigan, and he would survey back in the 1820s. And uh, he surveyed things like the Toledo Strip area, surveyed the Wisconsin-Illinois line. And believe it or not, he came up here to Boblo Island and he did a survey up here. And while he was surveying up here, he dropped a marker, a granite marker. So we're busting through the woods looking for that granite marker to see, to see if we can find something that was placed in 1827. So almost 200 years ago. We're gonna see if it's still there. We got about 400 meters to go or so. So Vincent's leading the way. <laughs> Get in trouble? <laughs> yeah. So we're thinking that we just came upon an old railroad grade. And they, when they logged the island, they set up railroads to do that. They had a few engines. So we're about 500 feet away, breathing hard like an old man. Ben said, it's like, what? It's a walk in the park, man. Well, we've almost traversed the peninsula. And the marker's going to be... Closer to the shore, but the shore's right over there. 
So usually they would install those on prominent features like hilltops. Yeah. So I think if we swing around, we can get in from up there. Yeah. I think I see it right there. Really? Yeah. There it is. <laughs> nice job. Who had Vincent found? You got a nickname or you go by Vincent? I mean, I've had plenty of nicknames, Vince, Vince. What do you prefer? I don't care. Is it all right if I call you Indiana Jones or Indy for short? Okay. All right. <laughs> so there it is. Granite marker, marker set there 200, almost 200 years ago. L-H-E. Look at that. That is awesome. So survey marker. This was carved out of the rock, but they smoothed the top. They installed this part of the lake survey. 1827, Lucius Lyons, after he installed this, went on to become the only person, the first person from Michigan to be both a senator and a house rep in the United States Congress. Pretty cool for a politician. He actually did something fun up here in the middle of nowhere. So this is probably why the marker's here. I haven't been this high above the shore on this island in a long time. Forever. I've only been on it. Have you been in a higher spot? I don't think so. At least this close to the water. So obviously prominent features were important when GPS didn't exist. This would definitely be a prominent feature. Detroit's down that way. Marker just off the shore. Almost looks like a gravestone, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Well, that's it. And uh, hey, nice to meet you. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Thanks for adventuring with me, and uh, we wish you the best of luck. Thanks, you too. And you're a good kid, so don't change. All right? All right, see you later. All right. So, if you get a chance, stop by Hawk's Landing or the Island Tavern. Spend some time doing a lot or nothing at all. They'll let you get away with it. It's a different place to visit, but well worth it. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe and like our video. Until next time, explore the path less traveled.